Thank you very much. I hope you hear me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Klaus. So let's get started. I hope you're seeing my screen. So the topic of tonight's talk is performance price of virtual functions. Now we know that virtual functions ca come with some kind of performance price, but we are not sure which one. So we will talk about that this this evening. So uh, I assume that you know what virtual functions are. So this is the most beloved feature of C++ because it adds a really the, the biggest flexibility to the language. However, they come with the performance cost. And as you will see later, the performance cost of virtual functions is not simple to measure because it depends on several factors. So let's get on to the to the to the uh, story. So first, uh, I assume that you know what virtual fun functions are, but the question is how virtual functions work. How does the comp compiler implement them? So uh, C++ standard does not mandate how the virtual functions are implemented. They can be implemented in one way or not another. However, most compilers do it do implement them in a similar manner in a similar similar manner. So with regards to virtual function, the address of the virtual function is not known at the compile time and it has to be looked up at the runtime. Uh, so each type, which means each class in your program has a special table called virtual function table. And it's tied each instance of the type. It has a pointer to this table. So the table is shared. So all the instances of the same type have a pointer to this table, but there is one table per type. The, 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 the compiler does not know the exact address of your functions when you're calling virtual functions. However, it knows the offset in the table. So the number in the table 0, 1, 2, where the, where the function is located. So let's see, let's see, let's see the, the example here. Now we have a we have a here array of instrument pointers, and the first instrument points to a wind instrument, the second point to the percu percussion object, the, the third one points to the string object, and the fourth one points to the brass object. You see inside each instance, there is this vir virtual pointer, this vi virtual pointer. Each, each class that has virtual methods has a virtual pointer uh, to a virtual table. Now we see here for each type there is a separate table. If you look at the, the virtual table, you will see that the wind, the entry zero in the virtual table has a, a method called play, entry one has a method called what, and met, uh, entry two has method called adjust. And these are all implementation using the wind class. But if you look at the lower, uh, at the lowest here, at the brass object, you see that the brass play and what functions are implemented using uh, in the brass class, but the adjust is inherited from the wind class. Okay, so this is how this is uh, this is how the the, the runtime no, runtime knows which function to call. In case of the brass object, it will if we call adjust on this object, it will call wind adjust. If we call adjust on this object, it will call percussion adjust. If we call adjust on the brass object, however, it will call wind adjust. So inside these inside these virtual tables, these are addresses of the functions. In the debugger, if you look at the GDB, you can see the VPTR as a as a like hidden hidden member. So it's not visible in the source code, but it's visible in the debugger. Uh, okay, questions about how virtual functions work? Okay, I guess no, none. If there are any Klaus, okay. So this is how the virtual functions are laid down, uh, how uh, objects are laid out in, in memory. But how is virtual functions mechanism when you call it? How does it work? Here is an example. We have an instrument, a class, a uh, pointer, which, po pointer to the instrument, which actually points to the brass object. Now we call uh, adjust method, and the compiler knows that the adjust method is in the virtual table at offset 2. So it goes to the offset 2, and then takes the address of this function and calls it. So in uh, for non-virtual function, if you're calling a non-virtual function, this is the address of the of the function is known at the compile time. So there is no this process. For virtual functions, however, there is this lookup process to look up the address of the of the virtual function in order to, to in order before calling it. 
So initial analysis experiment. So here's an experiment. We have a vector of 20 million objects of the same type. We have we, we iterated this vector. We performed 20 million calls to the virtual function versus 20 million calls to the non-virtual function. Now this is the runtime that uh, the, the runtimes I get from my computer, but I don't believe they are different elsewhere. So we have a short and fast function, and we have a long and slow function. Let's first focus on short and fast function. If it's a virtual function, 20 million calls took 153 milliseconds. If it's a non-virtual function, 20 million calls took 126 milliseconds. For the long function, it took 32 seconds for the virtual functions and almost 32 seconds for the non-virtual functions. So there is some overhead related to the uh, calling of a virtual function, but it's small, maybe 20%. And it only applies to short and, and, and fast virtual functions. Long and slow virtual functions do not exhibit this problem. Uh, so if we look, if we, if we look at like this, we say okay, the the the, the performance the performance difference is negligible, neg negligible for only for small function, and it's like 18 percent. That that's not that's not really important. But the question is, is this all there is to virtual functions? Okay. Now, any questions, Klaus? Are there any questions? So there's no questions yet. So okay. Please proceed. Okay. Yeah. So feel free to uh, type the, the questions on the chat and I'll answer them after each of the topic is, is done. So this is the end of our initial analysis, but I say it's not complete. Only on, This is only one part of the story. So the second part of the story is vector of pointers. So why is vector of pointers important? Well, in C++, virtual dispatching mechanism gets activated when we're accessing objects through pointers. So you, in order to use polymorphism, you need to have a vector of pointers to the base class, and each pointer points to, to, to an object which is of the derived type. So to use virtual dispatching, we need to allocate objects on heap. Now, the problem with accessing objects on the heap is that it can be really, really slow due to the data cache misses. If we have neighboring, so if we have, so here is a, here is a, visual representation of, of the problem. So we have a pointer to the, we have a, a vector which has pointers to the base class and we have two memory layout here. One is called optimal layout and the other one is called non-optimal layout. So in the optimal layout, we have a, the situation that the neighboring pointers in the vector point to neighboring memory addresses. And this is optimal layout or perfect layout. In the non-optimal layout, you have a situation when pointers, neighboring pointer, just point to random places in memory. Okay. Now, is there any difference? And the answer is yes. There is a huge difference here. So let's do an experiment. An experiment. At the beginning, we have a vector of objects that contains 20 million objects. We have another vector of pointers. And pointer at location i points to the object at location i. So we have pointer point at location i point to the object at location i. The vectors of object and a vector of pointers are completely same in size. This is the perfect or ordering. The perfect ordering means that the neighboring pointers point to the neighboring objects in memory. Now, what we want to do is we measure the time needed to iterate through 20 million objects by following the pointers in the vector of pointers. So this is the first thing. So we measure the time we need to iterate. But then let's do a, a little bit different. In the next part of the experiment, we pick a random pointer in the vector of pointers, and then we swap it with the pointer at place zero. So we are doing this swapping. What does this swapping do? Every time we swap these pointers, the data cache miss rate increments a bit. It's really small, but if you don't have point, uh, pointer swapping, it will, it will become visible, apparent. So what happens? So we have 20 million elements in our vector and we are doing swapping. So we have a runtime virtual function is in blue and runtime the same function but non-virtual is in red. And we are doing our measurement. When we're doing, so the on, on the X axis, you have a number of swap pointers. On the Y axis, 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 you have the runtime in milliseconds. 
So what happens at the beginning when there is no when the memory ordering memory layout is perfect? We have, the runtime is about 200 milliseconds, but as we are swapping more and more pointers, then the runtimes get worse, get worse, get worse up to a point when it becomes much much worse. From 200 milliseconds, when we swapped 16 million, so we swapped all 80 percent of the array, the runtime goes to 1.5 seconds. So it's slower. Uh, it's slower about seven times. So perfect ordering versus the worst ordering is seven times slower. Okay. So uh, as you can see, this is the problem that exists both for uh, virtual functions and non-virtual functions. But since you will use the the container with pointers in order to activate polymorphism, you will use the container with pointers. In that case, this situation is much more likely to happen with virtual functions compared to non-virtual functions. So worst case is 7.5 times slower than the fastest case. The slowdown isn't related to virtual functions per se, it's related to the memory layout. But you want to use vector of pointers because of the polymorphism. The good thing is there are alternatives to vector of pointers where you can benefit both from the flexibility of the virtual dispatching mechanism, but you won't suffer from the from the uh, from the uh, data cache misses. So what are the alternatives? One is to use STD variant with STD visitor. Uh, there is also something. This is my experiment. It's called polymorphic vector. So instead of uh, allocating objects on the heap, it allocates objects in the array itself, and then you can get uh, virtual dispatching and you can get uh, the perfect memory layout always. Uh, but the downside of this is increased memory consumption. If you need this, you can look it up in, in my blog. The next thing is the boost base collection. The boost base collection uses per type vector. So if you have eight types, you will have eight vectors and each type will belong to a, to a specific vector. It is very useful if you don't need a specific ordering in the vector. So if you, you, you are keeping objects in a vector, but the, the ordering of the objects is not important, then you can use boost based collection, which has a minimum, minimum uh, memory requirement, so it doesn't consume a lot of memory, and it's really good as far as performance is concerned. Okay, questions about vector of pointers. So there is a question in the chat. Um, yeah. I just read it. It's easier. So, what about references? Um, so uh, they could be on the stack too, right? You don't need the heap. You can. Uh, so, in, in my case, when I had in my experiment, where I had uh, when I had a vector of pointers and vector of objects, and each pointer was pointing to a object in a vector of objects. In that case, uh, in that case, I mean. Then, then it's not the problem that the vector of pointers, the problem is not the vector of pointers. The problem is that the pointers do not point to the neighboring memory uh, neighboring memory addresses. So if you want to solve this problem, you would need to make somehow that the neighboring pointers point to the neighboring addresses. As far as I know, you cannot have a container of references. That's not possible in, in C++. That's true. I think it was just the dimension that you do have to use the um, the heap. You could also have some some std array and point to these elements on the stack. That would yeah. work too. Okay, that's true. That that would work, but uh, this is not how to typically use. You fill this vector of pointers using a new. And the worst, there is one even bad thing is like if you have a like, small example, you're running your program like a small example and you're calling malloc in a loop. You will most likely get neighboring addresses. But if your program is running, running for a longer time, so memory is already a bit fragmented, there are spaces available here or there, and then the allocator will not return neighboring memory uh, locations. And you can see that at one point, sometimes in the past when the system was simpler, the program was running fine, but now it's slower. And this is what happened. The memory allocator, the, the fragmentation of the memory increased, has increased, and uh, so the performance went worse. Because the memory allocator was trying to save memory by giving you the the memory addresses that it already has, it didn't want to allocate new memory addresses. Okay. okay. 
hopefully this answers the question. Thank you. Oh, okay. Am I talking too slow, uh, too fast? I think it's okay. So please just go on. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so this finishes the talk about uh, vector of point, uh, vector of pointers and data cache misses. Next part of the puzzle related to virtual function, a virtual function mechanism is comp our compiler optimizations. Now, what about them? Well, the compiler knows the address of non-virtual functions at compile time. So this means the compiler can inline the non-virtual function and avoid the function call. Inlining does save a few instructions on the function call, but this is not what really matters. What really matters is after inlining, the compiler can perform many other compiler optimizations. So uh, the compiler has inlined a non-virtual function, and now it can do additional compiler optimization that it cannot do when you are calling a function with a function call, because function instructions within a function, function is a black box for a compiler. So what are these uh, what are these uh, compiler optimizations? For example, moving loop invariant code outside of the calling loop. So if you have a loop, and there is a, and there is a operation that is the same for each element of the of the for each element of the for each instance of the class, it is always the same. Then the compiler can move this operation outside of the loop and then save some cycles. It can also use special instruction that can process more data than one data at a time in a process called vectorization. Vectorization is a complex story for itself, but you cannot do vectorization if you have a function, function call. It doesn't work. So function calls inhibit vectorization. You want to use these special vector instructions because they are a few times faster than regular instructions. So here's an exp experiment with compiler optimizations. So I have here this class object. And it has this, this Boolean called is visible, and it has this integer ID, and this has this static unsigned integer called offset. Okay, we have three elements here. One is static, unsigned, which means that it is shared for all object instances. And here's a test loop. So in, uh, we're going through an array, which calls this object. So the array is perfect, it has a perfect memory layout. And we, we check if object is visible, then count plus equal object get ID of three. So this is get ID three, and it says return MID plus M offset. So it, it adds together these two numbers and returns them, okay? Now question is, what happens if this function is virtual function and what happens if the function is non-virtual function? So in this case, in this case, I didn't use virtual mechanism at all. I use uh, inlining versus no inlining because virtual function would add additional, uh, additional, additional um, virtual function mechanism is slower than calling a non-virtual function. And I wanted to measure the effects of inlining, not the effect of virtual functions. So I have a vector 20 million objects and the run times for the inline version is 136 milliseconds, and the runtime for the non-inline version is 224 seconds. Now, the, the, the runtime, the difference in runtime doesn't come only from, uh, from skipping the call, call uh, methods. Uh, so what happens here is if O is visible, that count get ID3, so it gets, it gets three, uh, it gets called this function. Now, the compiler doesn't need to load offset for every object in, from memory to the register because it is a constant, it is shared for all, for all objects. So it saves some instruction for calling, for, for, calling, uh, for loading offset from memory to register. With the non-virtual, with the non-virtual mechanism, with the, with the, when the function when the function is not in line, it has to call it load this offset from the memory to register every time, and this is what actually makes this code slower. So, what is the conclusion? Now, the conclusion is that when 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 inlining can be when the compiler can do inlining, it can perform more aggressive compiler optimizations. Virtual function mechanism inhibits inlining most in the most non-trivial cases. 
So there is this devirtualization, but in most non-trivial cases, the, the virtual function is not known in compile time, and it this inhibits inlining. And because of this, the compiler can do less less uh, can do less um, optimization, and and uh, that makes this code slower. So what is the solution? So the solution is a type-based processing. So your first project, so type-based Processing mean that for your first processing uh, all instances of type A, then all instances in another loop, all instances of type B, then in another loop, all instances of type C. So this is this is a nice approach because it allows compiler optimizations. So the compiler can do better job at optimizing. It is already implemented in this boost based collection. We already talked about it. But this approach doesn't work if objects in the in the collection has to have to be sorted. So if you have a specific sorting in mind, then it won't work. Now about the compiler optimization, I gave some numbers, but the benefit of the compiler optimization that happened due to unlining are very case dependent. Sometimes they will happen and they can have a large influence. Sometimes they will be negligible influence. Some code profit from a lot from compiler optimizations, other doesn't. Uh, in principle, smaller function benefit more from inlining than large function because in the large function there is already an, enough place for the compiler to to find places where it can when it, where it can do uh, compiler optimizations. Okay, this is the end of the compiler optimization topic. Any questions, Klaus? So we do have a couple of questions, but most of them are still about the um, vector of pointers that you mentioned before. So. Apparently, people needed it to process this information first. So, um, Akasdorf is asking, why not directly allocate a big chunk of memory? So, I just read the question. So, you, uh, so why don't you allocate directly? I mean, you can do that, but this is not what typically is done when you're using polymorphism in objects. You're just calling for each object with the new. So, if you're uh, if you're allocating for each block of memory for each type, then you are in the domain of type-based processing. So uh, it is, it is, I mean, it is, that is the, the way to solve it. The idea, the, the ideal goal is to have neighboring pointers point to the neighboring memory addresses and how you can do that. There are several ways how you can do that. And among other is to allocate a, a large block of memory. All right, and I think then there's a follow-up question. Um, so, for vector of pointers, is it a good idea to create your own allocator? Uh, yes, yes. If you have a vector of pointers and you want uh, you want polymorphism, you want vector of pointers, and you want speed. In that case, you can use a custom allocator, and this will allow you. This will guarantee with a custom allocator, you can guarantee that neighboring pointer point to neighboring memory addresses. You can guarantee that, which you cannot guarantee with the system allocator. So that is one of the ways to solve it. All right, thank you. Okay, no other questions? No other question at this time, no. Okay. Next thing I called jump destination guessing. Now this is a, something more advanced in the computer hardware. So to speed up computation, modern hardware does a lot of guessing. Technical term for this is speculative execution. So I'm not going to go into details. It's, it's a huge topic. But in the case of virtual function, the CPU can guess which func virtual function will get called and start executing the instructions that belo belong to the guessed virtual function. So the CPU has guessed and it went to the address and started executing instructions there. If the guess is correct, this saves time. If the guess is wrong, the CPU needs to cancel the effect of wrongly executed instruction and starts over, and this costs time. Now, this is about guessing. Let's do an experiment with uh, guessing, with, uh, with jump destination guessing. We have three vectors of 20 million objects. In the first vector, all the objects are sorted by type. So you first have all the objects of type A, then all the objects of type B, then all the objects of type C, and then all the objects of type D. In the second vector, types are sorted in a predictable fashion. So first element is A of type A, second is of type B, 
Third one is of type C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. So 20 million times. And the third one is where the, uh, where the tabs in vector are random. So we have randoms, B, C, A, C, A, C, B, B, A, C, B, A. Now we measure time needed to call a small virtual function, the three types of vectors. So the fu virtual function is small and we need, we are measuring how much time does it take to iterate over 20 million objects on all three of these vectors. So how does that look like? If the function, if the objects are sorted by type or sorted in a round robin fashion, then the runtime is about less, a bit less than 200 milliseconds. If the, the objects are unsorted, the runtime is a, a, a bit less than 500 milliseconds. So it's 2.5 times, 2.5 times slower. Now the question is why? The answer is if the types in the container are sorted in predictable manner and they're sorted for the uh, for the vector which has for the first and sector vector, second vector the types in the containers are sorted in predictable manner the CPU can predict the address of the virtual function it needs to call and this speeds up computation if the types are unsorted the CPU cannot guess successfully and precious cycles are lost so it's the, the, the CPU guesses the address of the virtual function, it goes there, starts execu executing instructions at the destination, but it made the wrong guess. It's not that virtual function, it's other virtual function. Then it has to revert this uh, job that it has done and then execute the, the, the correct virtual functions. Now, the solution to this is again, is type-based processing. However, type-based processing is not always usable. This effect is mostly visible with short virtual functions. So with long virtual functions, you don't see it because the 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 guess, so the virtual functions that take a lot a lot of time, the guessing phase is the guessing is is um, is just a fraction of the time that the or the complete runtime of the virtual function. Okay, questions. So yes, one. I think you just have to go back one slide to the results. Um, so the, the question is, is there also data slash instruction cache effects? We'll talk about it later. This is about this is about uh, jump misprediction, branch misprediction. There is also that part. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, in a minute. Perfect. And that's oh. it. Thank you. Okay. Next thing is called instruction cache evictions. So instruction. So I'm not going to go into details because these are hardware and trails hardware inside but uh, i'm going to give you some overview just enough so you can understand the talk so modern cpus rely on getting to know the instruction they're executing what means getting to know if the cpu has already executed the same uh, sequence of instructions several times it knows them better these instructions are in the instruction cache the branch predictors know the outcome of the branches the jump predictors know the target of the jumps there's also some other mechanisms in the CPU that can use to speed up computation. Now, we call the code that has already been executed several times by the CPU recently, we call it hot code. The CPU is faster when it executes hot code compared to when it executes cold code. So it is faster when it executes code that it's already executed recently. However, the CPU's memory is limited. The code that is currently hot will eventually become cold unless executed frequently. So the code gets colder, colder, colder if the CPU doesn't, doesn't touch it for some time and then it gets evicted and it's completely forgotten. Now, what, about, what does it have to do with virtual functions? Virtual functions, especially large virtual functions where each object has a different virtual function, means that we are switching from one implementation to another. We're switching from one function to another. So we're switching, we're calling a large virtual function of, of type A, then large virtual function of type B, then large virtual function of type C. Now the CPU is constantly switching between different implementations. So it's running the implementation of, 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 the, of the function A, then it's running the implementation of the, of, the, of the class B, then it's running implementation of the class C. So it is always running cold code because it keeps forgetting the, the, the code that it, it used to run. So can we measure these effects? Yes, we can. So there's an experiment. 
this is a difficult uh, uh, measuring the effect of instruction cache eviction is difficult because it depends on many factors. First factors, it first depends on the number of different virtual function implementations. So if you have two classes or three classes with virtual functions, it's fine. But you have, if you have 100 different classes where each class has a different virtual function implementation, then you, these effects will be more pronounced. The next thing that's uh, uh, the next thing that's also important is the number of executed instructions in the virtual function. So you have a big virtual function, but if only just few instructions are executed, like there is a huge, huge block of code that is never accessed, that, that, that from the point of hardware, it's as a small function. Uh, so this is also important. Next thing is what is important is how sorted are the objects in the container by type. Best case you will get if they're sorted by type, A, 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 B, 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 C, 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 D, D, D. Worst case is when they're sorted by type in a round robin fashion. So A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. Okay. How does the experiment go? We have four classes, rectangle, circle, line, and monster. We have four implementations of long virtual functions. The long virtual function consists of a for loop with a large if, else, if, else inside. So you have a long virtual function, there's a for loop inside it, and it has a large if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else block of code. So for measurement, we use two vectors each with 20 million objects. In the first one, the objects are sorted by type. In the second one, are sorted by type in a round robin fashion. So how do we measure the effects? We change the number of comparison in a large if, else, if, else, if, else block. So small block has two, three, four, five, seven, ten, twenty comparisons. And then we compare the time to needed to iterate the two vectors. So what is the result? So here is the number of if clauses in the function. So we go for 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. And we have on the on the y axis we have a relative difference. So we divided the, the the difference by when they're sorted by type. We divided by when they're sorted by uh, by type according to round robin. Uh, and you see here that uh, when the virtual function is small, they almost run in, in the same in the same time. We have four classes, so. At the beginning, they run almost the same, so it's about one. But as the time progresses, you see that the the runtime goes lower, lower. If you have forty, if you have forty, um, forty if else if else if else if, if forty comparison in this big if else if block, then case in that case the runtime is really bad. It's zero point six. So originally uh, zero point six compared to the best runtime. Now, uh, in our example, the cold code was running at the speed of 0 0.6 of the speed of the fast code. So this phenomenon is not related to virtual functions themselves. If you have a uh, classes where each in, in a pointer to a functions, data member which is a pointer to a function, and each pointer points to a different function, you'll observe the same effect. However, this effect is most likely to occur with large virtual functions of mixed type unsorted vectors. So if you have a Large virtual functions, you have uh, vectors with many deri different derived tabs that are unsorted. In that case, you will you will see this effect. Okay, questions. So we do have one question um, about the number of types that you use in the vectors. So do you use four types like ABCD or how many do you use? So I used here four, four classes, four, four types, rectangle, circle, line and monster. So there are four types. All right, so hopefully this answers the question. Okay, perfect, thank you. So in the worst case, the same function took 7.5 seconds to execute in the sorted vector and 12.3 seconds to execute in the round robin sorted vector. Okay, so what is the conclusion? So the virtual functions themselves do not incur too much additional cost because the cost does not come because there is an increased number of ex executed instruction. As you have seen at the beginning, it's maybe 20% slower for uh, small virtual functions. But the environment where the, where, where the virtual functions run is what determines their speed. What the hardware, the CPU craves is predictability. It wants same type, same functions, 
neighboring virtual uh, neighboring addresses, memory addresses. This is when the hardware runs the fastest. If you just use casually virtual functions without thinking about anything, uh, what we said, what we've said is you you will have difficulty achieving good performance with virtual functions. So the game developers where performance is important because if you don't have good performance, you cannot ship the game. This is another paradigm instead of object-oriented paradigm called data-oriented design. One of its major parts is type-based processing. So each vector holds one type only. This eliminates all the problems related to virtual functions. However, this approach is not applicable everywhere. Why is it not applicable everywhere? In gaming, they don't care about ordering of objects inside vectors, so they can use type-based processing. This is not applicable everywhere. So if you need to use virtual functions, which if you do OOP, you will certainly have to, you need to bear in my mind a few things. The number one factor that is responsible for bad performance are data cache misses, and this one that, that the, that's easiest to solve. So you should avoid vector of pointers on a hot path. Other factors also there play their own, like instruction cache evictions, uh, jump destination guessing, uh, wrongly guessed, etc. But compilation optimization, but to a lesser extent. So they're not that important. It is the the, the data cache misses that will that will create problems. If you do your design carefully, you can reap most benefits of virtual function without incurring too much additional costs. So here are a few ideas on how to fix your code with virtual functions. Arrangements of objects in memory is very important. Try to make small virtual, uh, try to make small functions non-virtual. So you can try that, it's not feasible every time. Most of the virtual functions comes from small functions, they cost more to call than to execute. Try to keep objects in the vector sorted by type. So these are two things, even if your object vector is not completely sorted by type, but even if it's partially sort by, sorted by type, this will the, the hardware will, will, will appreciate this. Okay, questions. So we do have one question about uh, the round robin type arrangement. Uh -huh. um, so let me just read it. Why does the round robin type arrangement result in the worst case for hot cold data? Whereas it fares fine in cases of speculative jumping. Okay, so uh, in speculative execution, in jump guessing, the pattern, what is important is the pattern. The pattern is important. If the hardware can recognize the pattern, it will work, it will work, it will guess perfectly. So you don't have to have A, B, C, D. You can have A, A, B, C, D, A, A, B, C, D. But the pattern, there has to be a pattern for the guessing. In instruction cache, pattern is not important. In actually, round robin, the objects are sorted in the round robin fashion, it's the worst. Because basically, you say there is no guarantee that in this vector there are two objects of the same type that are neighboring one another, one after another. So that means that the, the, the program will always run cold code, code, never hot code. If you have like a random, if you have a random uh, array which ran, where the types are randomly stored, then sometimes it will happen that two neighboring objects are of, are of the same type, and instruction cache will be warm and it can execute software. It can execute your code faster. All right, perfect. Okay. Any general questions? Okay. There is one more. So mm -hmm. just saw that. Did you uh, maybe measure how function size affects data cache effect? Function size do not affect data cache. They only affect instruction cache. Function size in no way affects data cache. Mm -hmm. So this is not the point of measurement. So, okay, one more thing that I forgot to say, but it's important is take this number as a, a don't take these numbers as uh, like, uh, okay, it's 2.5 times slower. In some cases, it can be 1.5 times slower, it can be more or less. It really depends on the, on the hardware, it depends on the code and so on. What you can expect in the future that the data cache misses will become more and more expensive because the memory is not becoming faster as the CPUs are becoming faster. So the, the CPUs are not as fast as memory. 
the memory is grows with the factor about 20%. Memory speed grows about 20% per year, and CPU speed grows about like 100% per year or 100% per 1.5 years Moore's law. But you can expect the effects of data cache and instruction cache to become more apparent as the time progresses. All right. Thank you very much. So if you have more questions for Ivika, yeah, some some live questions. Um, if you have some questions that you would like to ask in person, then please feel free to join us in our after talk chat. I just posted a Zoom link. If you click that, you can directly yeah, join us and, and talk chat um, about C++. So it would be great to see as many of you as, as possible. Then thanks to Vika for the talk. Um, thank you very much. And also, thanks for taking a time to or some more time to join us in the after talk. Too. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.